I'm Sylvia Onger. And I'm Rich Onger. We've been married for 61, 61 years. years. <laughs> I met her cruising way back when, and when I started to date her, I had to go to church. And I grew up in the Nazarene church. When we got married, I went to work for my dad. I worked for him for five years, mostly accounting, and then I worked for Sylvia's dad for five years. And I figured after that, well, maybe I could do something on my own because they were both self-made men. And so I got involved in an automotive aftermarket business, which became five businesses. And we retired out of that in 1991, 97 for sure. And uh, God's blessed us along the way. When we finally decided to move from California to Arizona, we arrived here and within two weeks I was in the hospital and somehow I had uh, got septic in my blood. I don't remember, several weeks. Um, I am almost fully recovered from that. What has become very clear to me is that I'm retired and I've gone through this latest episode. I don't know why I'm here, but I know God's got a plan for me. We realized that over the time that it's only from the valleys do you grow. grow. The last church before we moved to Arizona, I was the church treasurer for a while and also the chair of the finance committee. Uh, I really understand uh, church financing from the point of income and outflow. We are encouraged by things that are going on here. God has blessed us so much that we just feel like we want to bless other people. And uh, because God has been so good to us, uh, when we heard about the XL program and what's going on here, uh, we got kind of excited. We'd love to see this church spread out. We're new here, so we're really excited about the XL program and uh, we're looking forward to doing a pledge and uh, we're both excited, aren't we, honey? We are. <laughs> <laughs> we would be happy to be part of that. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. We are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Quad City Christian Church. I want to welcome all of those who are joining us online from whenever and wherever you are. So grateful that you are a part of our church this morning, as well as all of those out in Prescott Valley. Thanks for worshiping with us today. And everybody here in Prescott, so grateful to see your smiling faces this morning. Today is a special day for us as a church. It is Commitment Sunday, or for many of us, it is a recommitment Sunday. It's a day that we've kind of been building up two over the last several weeks together, and the fact that many of you knew that and you showed up anyway just reveals the heart that you have for God and his church, so I'm so thankful for you. If you're a newcomer with us today and you look in your seat and you see that card and you're like, oh, what did I get myself roped into today? Um, you can relax. Like, there's no shakedowns this morning. Nobody's going to make you do anything, uh, pressure you into anything. Actually, we're just really glad that you're here. And I hope that what you hear and see and experience among God's people this morning actually brings an encouragement uh, to your heart. Well, today we're wrapping up this series we've been in for the last few weeks that we've called Transformed. So, uh, we're going to begin today with probably one of the most famous Sunday school stories that you grew up with or heard in vacation Bible school. We're going to look at the story of a man named Zacchaeus. Now be honest, how many of you all heard the name Zacchaeus and started singing his song? Yes! Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. <laughs> Y'all just gonna leave me hanging? No, no, too late. I'm uh, no. Okay. Zacchaeus is the story we're gonna look at. You'll find this story in Luke chapter 19. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. Turn to Luke 19. Or if you have your guidebook, you can find it in your guidebook as well on page 42. 42 in our guidebook this morning. 
Um, throughout this series, the whole point has been to help connect the dots between our heart and our money. Like, what we've seen throughout Jesus' teaching and his uh, apostles is that one will reveal the other. Your money reveals your heart and your heart will be revealed through your money. And nowhere do I see this connection made more clear than in the life of Zacchaeus. So let's dive in. Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. So Luke, the one recording this event for us, sets the scene that Jesus was actually just passing through Jericho. Like he wasn't intending to stay there. He was on his way to Jerusalem. In fact, the next kind of segment in your Bible you'll find Zac uh, Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Like he's going to be dead in a week. Like this is kind of his last stand marching his way to Jerusalem. Okay. So that's what's happening. But Luke says on his way through, he meets someone else in Jericho, by a man by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, we're told, is a tax collector and he's wealthy. He's a rich man. Now, if this was a movie, when you got to the name Zacchaeus, the music would change. It would go into minor keys and dong, 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 right? Because you introduce this character and he's the bad guy. He's wearing the black hat in this story. Zacchaeus is a bad guy because Zacchaeus works for the enemy. He is a Jewish man living in a Jewish community, collecting taxes from his Jewish neighbors and handing them over to their enemies, the Romans. He's collecting taxes for the occupying nation that has got their, keeping the, the, the Jewish nation under their thumb. I was trying to think of a way to help kind of explain this in modern day terms. The best that we could come up with was, imagine you live in Ukraine today, okay? You've lived in Ukraine your whole life, and your Ukrainian neighbor becomes a tax collector to take money from the rest of your Ukrainian people, and that Ukrainian neighbor actually works for the Russians, and that Ukrainian neighbor is collecting taxes from you and all of your other families, and they're sending those taxes to the Kremlin to subsidize the soldiers that have invaded your city. That is Zacchaeus. The way that you'd look at that tax collector is the way the Jewish people looked at Zacchaeus. But it's even worse than that. Because Zacchaeus is not just a tax collector. He is a chief tax collector. In other words, think of it like a uh, mid-level marketing scheme. Zacchaeus is on the top and he employs other tax collectors to go do the work and he gets a cut of everything they collect before it gets sent to the Romans. That's why he's rich. But nobody can touch him. Nobody can do anything against him. Nobody can stop him because he has the backing of the Roman Empire. The soldiers in that city get their paycheck because Zacchaeus is out collecting taxes from the Jewish people. So that's a bit of the backstory. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Like everybody else in the town, they hear Jesus is coming, and he decides, i got to go see this guy. And the, the town is in a frenzy, and everybody is flooding the streets. There's just one problem. Zacchaeus cannot see over the crowd. Like whenever I picture Zacchaeus, I picture like Danny Levito, Danny DeVito. I picture Danny DeVito. Or Ken May, like one of those, I picture those guys. 
Can't you just see him just kind of jumping up and trying to look over the crowd, trying to see Jesus in the streets, but he can't. So what's he do? He runs ahead and he finds a tree and he climbs up inside of the tree so he can get a glance at Jesus. The sycamore fig tree is a big tree with big branches that are low to the ground. It's easy to climb and it has big leaves so you can see out without necessarily being seen So that's what Zacchaeus did. And he has no idea how his life is about to change. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. He had no expectation that he'd actually get a VIP introduction that he'd get to connect with Jesus or host Jesus. No one expected that of Zacchaeus. You will often read in Scripture in the New Testament that they'll talk about tax collectors and sinners and tax collectors and sinners. Have you ever wondered why it is you have tax collectors and sinners? Why is it that tax collectors get their own category? It's because you don't want to offend sinners by putting them in with tax collectors. Like legit, they get their own category because they're so bad. These guys are the worst. No one was walking up to Zacchaeus this day. Nobody was inviting themselves to Zacchaeus' house. But Jesus does exactly that. He stops at the tree and he calls Zacchaeus by name. And how does Zacchaeus respond? He came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. To which I say, I bet he did. I bet Zacchaeus could not get out of that tree fast enough. Everyone in this crowd would have loved the opportunity to have this kind of intimate, up close, and personal connection with Jesus. But Jesus stopped at the tree and invited Zacchaeus to this moment. So they climb down and he welcomes him into his home. And as they're heading into Zacchaeus' house, the crowd's following behind. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. The crowd's muttering because they cannot believe that Jesus is even giving this guy the time of day. He's the worst. Why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus invite himself into the house of somebody like Zacchaeus? And we'll find out the answer to that in just a few minutes. No doubt, Jesus and his disciples would have followed Zacchaeus to the house. They would have likely sat down around a table and reclined, laying down, sharing a meal together with Jesus as the guest of honor in the presence of Zacchaeus' friends and family. And somewhere in the midst of that conversation, something happened on the inside of Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. In this moment, Zacchaeus makes a public declaration. I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor and anybody I have cheated, I will make restitution for. And I'm not just gonna pay them back, I'm paying them back with interest four times over. And what we're witnessing in this moment is what the scriptures call repentance. This is what repentance looks like. We often hear repentance and we think repentance is feeling bad and saying sorry. That's not what biblical repentance is. Biblical repentance requires three things, conviction, confession, and change. And we find all of these in this story of Zacchaeus. He was convicted. He's convicted because apparently there's no record of Jesus mentioning Zacchaeus' money. There's no record of him telling Zacchaeus that he's cheated people or that he's misusing his funds 
or that he's bad for being rich, yet Zacchaeus is feeling some conviction in this area because he stands up and promises to make restitution. Because he's a tax collector, he has likely extorted people. Like that's how you make your money as a tax collector. Rome says you have to collect this amount, but anything you can get out of the people that's above that, you get to keep it. That's how he got rich. And so he's convicted, but after he's convicted, he says, not only am I gonna make that right, I'm gonna confess it before you. I've done this thing and I will make it right but I'm also gonna change. I'm gonna give half of my possessions to the poor. And I want you to see how Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save that what was lost. This was why Jesus stopped at that tree to save that which was lost, to seek and to save Zacchaeus. With this commitment to generosity, what we find is evidence of his repentance, which is proof his repentance is proof of his transformed heart. And because Jesus can connect the dots, his act of obedience to repent, to, to rectify his wrongs, to declare his transformation, that reflects a heart that has genuinely been changed. And Jesus can look at that and say, today salvation has come to this house. You can see it through what he's doing in this moment. True faith always leads to repentance. And repentance always reveals a transformed life. And a transformed life will always be revealed in our obedience to Jesus. This is a great story. It's a story of a heart that shifts It's allegiance from its wealth and its stuff to allegiance to Jesus. Now, here's what we know, though. Not every story like this has a positive ending. In fact, if you were just picking up your Bible and reading the book of Luke, you've already seen a story like this not end like this you'd see this story of another man that Jesus encountered. In fact, Luke puts the stories right next to each other, just a few paragraphs apart. If you have your Bible, all you have to do is look up a few paragraphs to Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. And there you'll find another man. And this other man, we're told, is also a ruler. In other words, he has people under him just as Zacchaeus does. And again, we're told he's rich. Again, just as Zacchaeus is rich. But unlike Zacchaeus, this man went looking for Jesus. He went and sought Jesus out and came up to Jesus to have a conversation. And here's how it goes. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this guy's looking for eternal life. He wants to experience the salvation that Jesus has to offer. And he comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to get that? Well, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother. Jesus says, you wanna be saved? Don't be a sinner. Like just obey the law. Do the things that you're supposed to do. And in this moment, you can kind of see this guy get his chest puffed out a little bit and his shoulders rock back and he responds to Jesus. All of these I've done, I've kept these since I was a boy. Like I've checked all those boxes. So tell me I'm good, Jesus. 
Jesus isn't done. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And here again, we have this dichotomy that we've seen all throughout the series where Jesus says, your allegiance is gonna be either to me or to your stuff. Are you willing to give up everything and follow me? Are you willing to do that? Jesus made it very clear that's what it was going to take for this man to experience salvation. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. So Jesus made it clear what he needed to do. And what Jesus said to him made him very sad. Why? Because he loved his money more than he loved Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Imagine Jesus looking you in the face. Jesus looked at him and said, It wasn't that Jesus mumbled this as the guy was walking away. Jesus looked this guy in the eye and says, it is so hard to get rich people into heaven. And he's standing there and he's sad. And the crowd around him hears it and they pipe up. Well, then who then can be saved? I mean, Jesus, if what you're saying is true and this guy isn't getting in, this guy who's been blameless, like he says he hasn't broken any of those commands. He's kept them since he was a kid. And obviously he's been blessed by God. Look at how much wealth he has. I mean, if this blessed, obedient guy can't get in, who can get in? We're left with this question, this nagging question, can rich people even be saved? To which Jesus responds, what's impossible with man is possible with God. In other words, you can't do it on your own. There's nothing in you that's going to be able to make this happen. It's going to take the supernatural work of God to make this happen. But it almost seems impossible. Because as you go through the Gospels, it leaves us with a bit of doubt. Because again, we're just a week away from the crucifixion. Jesus has been doing his ministry for for about three years now. And when it comes to rich people in Jesus' ministry, we've not seen any of them come to the saving faith in Jesus that I can remember. You might go check and find one, but of all the stories of Jesus' interaction, the rich people are always the bad guys. Jesus only ever offers warnings against being rich, which makes us ask, can the rich even be saved? So Jesus has this interaction with this rich guy, and then we drop down just a few paragraphs later, and we meet Zacchaeus. Another rich guy, another ruler of sorts. But unlike the first rich guy, Zacchaeus, he didn't go up to Jesus, Jesus came to him. And unlike the other rich guys, Zacchaeus wasn't blameless. He was a sinner, a big bad sinner. And everybody knew it, including Zacchaeus. But as soon as Zacchaeus understood that his allegiance was either going to be to his money or to Jesus. Zacchaeus stood up and said, today I denounce my allegiance to my stuff. And I will give half to the poor. I will repay everybody I have cheated. Zacchaeus voluntarily did almost everything Jesus commanded the other rich guy to do. We're told that Jesus, I'm sorry, we're told that Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus gladly. And the other man stood there sad. 
one of these two men heard salvation has come to this house. And the other one was told, it's harder to get guys like you into the kingdom than to get a camel through an eye of a needle. Two rich men. Two different destinies. And what made the difference? Was it because one gave his money and one didn't? Did Zacchaeus buy his way into the kingdom of God? The answer is no. He did not know. The difference was one loved his money and one loved Jesus. That's what set them apart. It wasn't the money that was the issue, it was the heart that was the issue, and the money always just puts the heart on display. And that's what we've been saying all throughout this series. Our hearts and our money are connected, and one is always revealed by the other. Can a rich person be saved? Yes. Zacchaeus emphatically teaches us the answer is yes. Rich people can be saved when they, like everybody else, are willing to bring everything under the lordship of Jesus, including their money. Because that is the result of a heart that has truly been transformed by the gospel of God's grace. And I hope that's you. And no matter where it is where you fall on the spectrum of rich or poor, that Jesus has transformed your heart. And that transformation can be seen clearly right now. It will be displayed tomorrow. And it will continue to be displayed for the rest of your life through your faithfulness, through your integrity, and through your generosity. Because our hearts and our money are irrevocably connected to one another. Which brings us to those cards that are in your seat this morning. I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and grab that card that you came in and sat on. What we're doing today is that we are declaring that we are all in. That everything that we have and everything that we are belongs under the authority of Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives. And that we are all in to see his agenda accomplished on this earth as it is in heaven. This card is just one way that our hearts are displayed, our transformed hearts are revealed. It is an opportunity for us to do all the things that we've talked about throughout this series. To lay up treasure in heaven, to be rich towards God, to fight off greed that longs to devour us, and to put our transformed hearts on display. It's about not just what God's doing through us, but what he's doing in us. For sure, it helps Quad City to fuel and fund the work of making more and better disciples, both locally and globally. But what he does to transform us and to break the bond that our money has on our hearts is just as important. And this card is an opportunity for us to stand up just as Zacchaeus did and to declare our commitment to the Lord. And I want to take just a couple of moments to walk through this card with you. For some of you, there's essentially three categories that we're going to fit in this morning. For some, you're brand new to this whole thing. You haven't heard any, you weren't around last year when we kicked off Excel You've sat through some of these teachings and you kind of get where we're going. You got your guidebook. You understand the point. 
but you're brand new. And if that's you, we're so glad that you're joining us on this journey. And so what we'd invite you is just to check and say, hey, I'm making a commitment. It's a 12-month commitment. I know I'm joining in at the midpoint, but I want to be a part. And then just write down whatever it is that you feel like God's calling you to give in the next 12 months to help us fulfill the mission that he's given us. Now, there's a lot of others of us who were around a year ago, and we did make our own commitments. And again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity that has allowed us to do so much good over the last year. If that's you, then this is your column. Like, I've already committed to Excel. And I want you just to take and say, this is what we committed to Excel a year ago. When we filled out these cards a year ago, here's what we said we would do. And so you just write it right there. And then you got two options. You can either say, one, I want to confirm my commitment to finish strong. Like, we made this commitment, and we know we're only halfway done, and we're going to finish what we've started. Like, we're going to trust God that he's going to complete what he called us to. And if that's you, we want to celebrate that. We want to celebrate that. So our goal is that everybody on both of our campuses and online would be a part of this. Like, we want everybody to fill out a new card. And for those of you who are online, we have a digital version for you. Like, we want to invite you into this. If you're with us each and every week and you are a part of Quad City, you consider this your church, just scan the QR code on your screen and you've got a digital version. You can walk through this exact process with us. So if you're in that, say, I just want to finish strong. We want to celebrate that. We want to applaud that and to continue to see God work in your life. But there may be others of you who look and say, you know what, my situation is different than it was a year ago. God has continued to bless us. Our resources have grown. Or maybe it's just our faith has grown. And we see how God is faithful. When we think we're giving, it's, he just keeps giving back and we see his faithfulness. And maybe you're at a place where you say, you know what, for the last year, I want to increase my commitment. And then you just write, what is the new total of your increased commitment? giving and you could put it right there in that box and then lastly we'd invite everybody to fill out that last section just to tell us who this card belongs to now I know that some of you you'd rather do this anonymously but honestly that's just not very helpful if there's no information at the bottom that we can connect the card to a person we just have to chuck it because we don't know if it was one that you started and you messed up and put one too many zeros at the end and so we had to, you had to do another one. Or if it's just a prank, because we had a couple of those last year. Thanks for that. So if it doesn't have a name connected to it, we just it's just not helpful. And again, I know some of you are leery about filling out the card, but we need to do it. Like we need to do it. We need to put our name to this. Because this is us literally declaring our intention to step out and grow in the grace of giving. And what we're declaring through this commitment card is that I'm choosing to make this a priority in my life, that it matters to me. Now, this is not a legal document. Like Nobody's going to take you to court, put a lien against your house, or garner your wages over this. It's not a legal document. It's actually more important than that. It is a proclamation that has the ability to hold us to account when the energy and the emotion of these moments fall away. And it's through putting our name to this that we're driving a stake in the ground and declaring what's most important to us. And not only do we need to do it for ourselves, we need to do it for the church like these commitments are what allow our leadership to make wise financial decisions moving forward. To know how much to expect at what season so that we can make decisions about what God's calling us to do next. So please make sure and put your info on it. Right now, we wanna take just a few minutes and give you a chance to kind of work through this process on your own. Again, we want everybody, no matter where you are, to to fill out a card and to 
to join us in this moment. We just want to ask you to pray over it. Maybe pray with your spouse if you're together. Asking God to do his work in you, not just do his work through you. Give the Holy Spirit a moment to affirm, yes, this is what he's calling us to. And then we'll come back out and we'll give some further instructions. But take a few moments to spend with the Lord right now. Father, we are grateful that we get to be a part of this, that you've invited us into something so great. So I pray in these next few moments that as we think about all you've done in us and through us, that we would, with joy, celebrate this moment that we get to be a part of seeing life change in and through others. So Father, do your work among your people today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.